Lord Jesus, when we sing those words, asking you to come, we mean them in so many different ways. Lord Jesus, we need you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to remind us that we are children of God. Lord, that we are loved by God because of what you have done for us. Lord Jesus, we need you in the midst of a new year, in the midst of classes and relationships. And Lord Jesus, we do pray as your people who look around us at a world that is full of unrest, full of danger, full of sin. Lord, our prayer is that you would come again, that you would make all things right, that you would heal those who are wounded, that you would bring your final perfect justice. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that even as we're gathered together talking about your church this morning, that you would fill us with new and revived love for you. You're our Savior, our King, you are the only hope for sinners. And so, Jesus, we look to you together this morning, even as we begin this new year. And we do it for your glory. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, I'm going to be doing something for the next few minutes that I don't normally do. And you'll notice, um, if you're with us throughout the course of this year, uh, you'll notice that I don't do this very often. I'm going to be giving a topical message. Um, some of you know that even in the college ministry here, we devote ourselves to what's called an expositional way of teaching, which means that generally what you're going to get when you come to college group on a Sunday morning is you're going to get me working through a text of scripture and trying to preach the main point and apply it to your lives in the way that I think the Holy Spirit intended it to be applied as we look at the text structure and its shape and all those kinds of things in context. But as we're beginning a new year together, um, I want to give the message that I, I often give. It's a little bit of a different version, but it's a message called Loving the Church. And I think it's appropriate. A lot of you are starting college for the first time. Some of you are returning to college. You've been gone over the summer. It's the beginning of a new year. And so it's appropriate, I think, for me as a pastor to challenge you on the nature of the place of the church in your life during your years as a college student, or if you're not in college, during your 18 to 23 year old years. So that's what I'm gonna be doing this morning. And I wanna begin this way, I wanna give you three pictures. These are metaphors, these are not real stories, I wanna be clear about that, as you'll see in a moment. These are metaphors, these are pictures that uh, will lead us into our theme, our topic this morning. So picture number one, okay, I want you to picture this with me. Um, it's a scene in my kitchen. I get home from work after a long day and I walk into the door and there's my wife, Jeannie. Is Jeannie here? Yeah, Jeannie's back there. Hi, Jeannie. Um, and again, this is not a true story. So I walk in the door of my kitchen. Jeannie is there waiting for me and I see that she has a very serious, somber, thoughtful look on her face. And I say, hey, Honey, how are you? Uh, did you have a good day? She says, yeah, I'm doing okay, John, but I, I just have been thinking about something that I need to share with you. I've been thinking, John, I really love you. I want you to know that. I really love you, but I have to tell you something. I hate your body. I mean, I, I can't stand it. I can't stand your face or any <laughs> other part of your body. I want to be clear, I really, really love you, but I, I can't take your body. You've got to do something. <laughs> the first picture. Second picture, I want you to picture that in my, in my office, some of you heard Josh Moody speak uh, last, last hour in the 9.30 service, that I go over down the hall to Josh Moody's office and say, hey Josh, I was wondering if you wanted to come over for dinner, spend some time with me and Jeannie. And Josh says, and I can't do a British accent as well as he could do a Southern accent this morning. <laughs> but I want you to imagine that Josh said to me, yeah, you know, John, I'd love to spend some time with you. I really enjoy sitting down with you, but I gotta tell you something. I hate your wife, can't stand her. So if you wanna hang out with just the two of us, that's great, but uh, I, I don't wanna spend any time with Jeannie, okay? Third picture, again, these are not true stories. Third picture, <laughs> I want you to imagine, first, there's actually a bunch of things you need to imagine in, in this third story, but the first is that there's a bar in downtown Wheaton. <laughs> the, 
second is that, the second is that as you're passing by that bar in downtown Wheaton, you see John Nielsen, your pastor, walking into that bar, and you notice something as I enter that bar, you notice that I surreptitiously, very secretly, slip off my wedding ring and put it in my pocket and then walk into the bar. Okay, three pictures. Now, each of those pictures in their own way, in its own way, gives a metaphor, a picture, an illustration of what people are doing when they make statements like this. I love Jesus, but I really don't want to have any part of the church. I love Jesus, but I'm not so sure about being involved in a local church. And here's why. Number one, the one about Jeannie saying, hey, I love you, John, I hate your body. Um, scripture makes it clear, as we'll look at in a moment, that the church is the body of Christ. That's again and again a metaphor that is used for the church in Scripture. The, the, the Bible also makes it clear that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is his, his wife. And then the third picture, as we'll look at again in a moment, is that our public identification with the church, just like you wear a wedding ring to publicly identify yourself as being a married person, is an important part of what it means to be a Christian. That is publicly, openly identifying yourself with Christ by being a member of a local church. So all three of those pictures give us an idea of what it looks like when someone says, I love Jesus, hate the church. Now, the point that I want to make to you this morning is really a simple one. It's this. It's a call for you all during your college years to make a priority of the local church of Jesus Christ. To give yourself to it, to attend it, to serve it, to love the people in a local body of Christ during your college years. That's the simple call that I want to give you this morning. And to get there, what I want to do is actually make a few basic points about what the Bible teaches about the capital C church, the universal church. So we're going to do that. These are going to be review for some of you. Uh, they might be a little bit of a different way of, of talking or describing these things for others of you. But we're going to remember biblically what the church is. And you'll have some slides behind me. We're going to read a few passages of scripture as we do this. So what is the church? What is the church? First of all, number one. The Bible makes clear that the church is a people, not a place. It's a people, not a place. So look at 1 Peter, what Peter writes in 1 Peter 2. He says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of beautiful churches in the town of Wheaton. I think we have one of them. I think our sanctuary is absolutely beautiful. But without the people of God gathered corporately to worship Jesus in that sanctuary, it would not be the church. The church is a people. You yourselves, like living stones, are the spiritual house of God, not a building. Now, from time to time, uh, I, have two, I have three daughters, but the two oldest are old enough to run around. Uh, sometimes on a rainy day when we can't go for a walk outside— They'll say, Dad, can we go run around church? And I'll say, sure, we can go run around church. Now, I would actually be more correct by saying, Adeline, it's not the church unless it's Sunday and the people of God are gathered there corporately for worship. Now, I don't do that. because That would make me a really um, annoying father. But unless we're going on a Sunday when the people of God are gathered for corporate worship, we're actually not going to the church. We're running around a building. So it actually isn't sacrilegious to let my kids run around the pews and climb around the balcony, although I don't do that in your sanctuary. But you get what I'm saying. It's the people of God, not the place that is the church. Number two, a church, the church, is something that Jesus Christ himself loves. Now, people who get cynical about the church and who are always criticizing the church and pointing out all the things wrong with it need to remember this. It's not wrong to be perceptive about the problems in the church and to say, yeah, there's there's hypocrisy going on in various places. But we can't miss the fact that, as this verse points out, the church is something that Jesus himself loves. Let me just read this from Ephesians 5. It's actually the context of Paul's teaching about marriage. But as he's teaching about marriage, he speaks of the love that Jesus has for the church. So he writes, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, 
having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus loved the church. Jesus died for the church. Jesus' desire is that the people of God would be made holy, pure, without spot or blemish, so that they can be presented perfectly to him on the last day. He loves the church. And the fact that Jesus loves the church actually was pointed out to me a, a few months ago. We were studying Revelation, and we made it to Revelation 2 and 3. Do you remember what happens in Revelation 2 and 3? Jesus shows up. So John, the Apostle John, has this glorious vision of the risen, victorious Christ, Jesus the King. And remember, he's showing up in first century Rome, the Roman Empire. And Jesus, showing up in the second chapter of Revelation doesn't address his speech to the Roman emperor, you might think that he would, to Caesar. Who does Jesus show up in all of his glory to address in, in Revelation 2 and 3? These little dinky local churches across Asia Minor. So Jesus, the king of the universe, shows up in this vision to John, and he has words for the church at Ephesus. Hey, the church at Laodicea, I've got something for you. Church at Philadelphia, church at Smyrna. I've got a word for you. Where is Jesus' heart, the glorious risen king of all things, where is his heart at? It's with the local churches, these little gatherings of believers. It's something that Jesus loved. Number three, number three, the church is the body of Christ. I mentioned this before. Uh, lots of places in the New Testament describe the church as the body of Christ. This is just one, Ephesians 1. And he put all things under his feet, that is Jesus' feet, and gave him his head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, I want to bring you back to that statement that we kind of made at the beginning, this idea that a lot of pious, religious-sounding Christians want to make today. It's this statement, hey, I love Jesus. I want to have a pure relationship with Jesus as I follow him, but I don't want anything to do with the church. There's too many problems, too much hypocrisy. Now, given this metaphor, what is someone who makes that statement actually doing to Jesus Christ when they make that statement? What are they doing? Decapitating him. Right? If you take it seriously. They are actually breaking apart the head from the body. And they're actually trying to sound pious and religious and holy in doing it. So what starts as this nice sounding, hey, let's establish a pure religion. I don't want any part of organized religion. I just want Jesus. It's actually gruesome, and it's disgusting, and it's something that Jesus himself would never want his people to do. It's the body of Christ. Number four, the church is God's main weapon in the world. Now, I mean that not as an offensive weapon. I'm not talking crusades here. It's obviously a weapon. The gospel in the hands of the church is a, is a weapon of healing of hope, of forgiveness, of eternal life. But look at what Paul says in Ephesians 3. He says, To me, though, I am the very least of all, all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light from everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And here's, listen to this. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What has God, what is the weapon that God has entrusted to the church in this world? It is the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the manifold wisdom of God. We know that's the gospel. We know it's the message of Christ because of Paul, what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. That, that weapon, the ultimate way that God is wielding his power, his eternal kingdom in the world through the gospel, is committed to the church. And I love the way the Gettys have this hymn called, O Church Arise. Have any of you sung that, O Church Arise? And they describe the sword of the gospel, the sword of the word, and they say, with the sword that makes the wounded whole. That's the kind of weapon I'm talking about. Not an offensive, violent weapon, but the weapon of the gospel that God has committed to his church to do his work in the world. And then the last one, number five, what is the church? The church is the only eternal institution in the world only eternal institution in the world. So there, there are lots of institutions. There are governments. There are uh, Christian education institutions like the one across the street. Um, it is the church that at the end of all things will be the only institution that will be lifted up and will endure for all eternity. 
to look at Revelation 21 and John's vision at the end of time. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. That's the church. That's the gathered people of God. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. The church is the only institution that will endure through all eternity because God in Christ has eternally committed himself to its welfare. It's amazing. Now, everything we've been talking about up to this point is true of the universal church. What is the universal church? It's the global church. It is the gathering of all of God's people, everyone who's trusted Jesus for all time. That's the universal church. And the local church that we'll now shift to talk about for just a few minutes, I want to be clear, it is something different. It's a localized manifestation of the universal church. But I don't want you to see it as something that's in a totally separate category than the universal church. Does that make sense? So generally, what the Bible says about the universal church, these five things that we just looked at, can generally be applied to the local church as well. So a quick kind of history on the local church. This will be really quick, but the local church, this more specific meaning that we're going to talk about for a few minutes here, happened, began, as the universal church, that is all people who trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, began to grow in the first century. So if you look at Acts 2, before Acts 2, there was maybe a couple hundred believers in Jesus Christ. There was the disciples and then everyone else who had seen the risen Christ and had trusted him. Then Peter in Jerusalem in Acts 2 gives this sermon at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descends on the apostles and they start speaking in all these other languages. And that day, Acts 2, 3,000 people give their lives to Christ just like that. So Acts 2, you've got this explosion, 3,000 people, 3,000 new Christians in Jerusalem. From there, they start going back to their towns and their cities across Asia Minor. And what happens is not one huge gathering of all the universal church. What happens is that local churches begin to be established by Paul and the other apostles in the various towns and cities in Asia Minor. Now, it's important that the Bible calls these the church at X location. So it's the church. It's the local manifestation of of the universal church, the church at Ephesus or the church at Philippi, the church at Thessalonica, local churches. Now, a couple things then begin to happen as these local churches get established across Asia Minor. First of all, Paul and the other apostles instruct them that they're supposed to give uh, leadership to these churches. So Paul will write to Titus, uh, you need to train up elders who can be over these local churches. So there's the rule of these elder pastor people. Presbyteros is the Greek word that's used for those. So there's, there's the rule of pastors and elders in these local churches. And then the other thing that happens is they start to get characterized by two main activities. Number one, the preaching of the word. So the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. And then the celebration of the sacraments, Lord's Supper and baptism. So you've got the rule of elders in these local churches, and then you have the preaching of the word, the celebration of the sacraments, and then all the other things that happen in church. Fellowship, giving, uh, singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs helping other churches who are in trouble, so this giving of financially, caring for widows, caring for orphans, all of these things begin to happen in these local manifestations of the universal church. Okay, so here's our definition then of the local church. A local church is a localized manifestation of the universal church that gathers regularly for worship under the rule of elders and pastors with the preaching of the word and the celebration of the sacraments. I know it's a long definition, but it has to be long. Kind of complicated. So, the local church. Now, I want to, in a minute, just make a few really specific then concrete applications for you all. Because you're starting to ask, okay, John, what, what does this mean for me this school year? I'm going to get there, but let me just clarify a couple things before I do. Given what we've just talked about, you cannot make sense of huge portions of the New Testament if you are not a part of a local church. There is, I would say, the majority of the New Testament. You cannot rightly apply, obey, understand, unless you are a a communing member of a local body of believers. 
So the apostles, Paul and Peter and the others, as they wrote, would not have had any category in their minds for a churchless Christian. Like, you know, Joe Christian, who's just floating, like that video they showed in the corporate service of, of the, the guy who goes up on the mountaintop alone. That wouldn't have been a category for the apostles, a churchless Christian. Their assumption, as they wrote, as Paul wrote Philippians, as he wrote Ephesus, uh, Ephesians, as he wrote 1 Corinthians, as he wrote 1 and 2 Thessalonians, the assumption was that the Christians he was writing to were members. They were communing, giving, participating, serving parts of local bodies of believers in their towns. So I would, I would make the argument that you can't even apply the New Testament rightly if you're not part of the local church. And let me say this too. If you're a Wheaton College student, you have a president who will say to you in a few days, as he does at the start of every year, very explicitly, Wheaton College is not a church. Now, Wheaton College is a wonderful Christian academic institution. I went there. I love it. We support it. Uh, we're so proud. I'm so proud to be a graduate of Wheaton College and to be working with so many of you who are students at Wheaton College. But it's not a church. And your president and your interim chaplain and then your permanent chaplain, whoever that's going to be, is going to tell you the same thing. Now, I know it gets a little fuzzy because Wheaton College provides a lot of things that the local church also provides. And we can have different conversations about how some of those things ought to work. But the point is this. The local church is a different category than the institution across the street, according to the definition that we see in Scripture. So given that, let me just leave you with three simple kind of points. They're simple in that they're easy to understand. They're not simple to practice. But I do want to challenge you on these points as you start this new school year. Okay, ready? Number one. Go to church. <laughs> Go to church. Okay, pretty basic. Uh, although you would be surprised as you get into the year, some of you new freshmen especially, what percentage of the campus is not going to a local church on any given Sunday morning. And it's sad. That really does sadden my heart. But as you start your year, make a commitment. Make a commitment to God. Get, some, get a friend. Get a family member to hold you accountable. Then every Sunday morning, you're going to wake up. You're going to take a shower, get dressed, go grab some food at the dining hall. Is there breakfast on Sunday? Or is no, it just brunch? Yeah. Okay, don't get breakfast. Eat after. <laughs> Eat bagels here. Put on some clothes, grab a friend, and go to church. Go to church every Sunday during your year. That's my first challenge to you. Number two, I'm going to take it a step further. I want to challenge you to consider joining a church this year. So not just go to church, join a church. And yes, I'm talking about membership. I'm talking about becoming a member of a local church. Uh, Josh Moody, our senior pastor, has talked about membership as something that is a visible sign of an invisible reality. So it, it's like the wedding ring that I shared about. The wedding ring does not make me married. But it is a visible sign of something that is an invisible reality, that Jeannie and I are, before, before God, before all the witnesses who were there at our wedding, we're married. We're one in the eyes of God. This is a visible sign. In the same way, membership is a visible sign that you belong to Christ invisibly by faith. And there's a very real sense in which, if you're not a part of a local church, if you're not a part of a body of believers, if you're not a member, then how does anybody even know you're a Christian? Now, I want to say, too, practically, that membership in the local church has huge, huge benefits for you as a Christian during your college years. So when you become a member, when you commit yourself to a local church, you are placing yourself under the spiritual care and authority of godly elders and pastors who will commit to caring for your heart and soul as a member of their congregation. Uh, you are, in essence, saying, and I, I think this about my own membership often, when you become a member of a local church, you are saying to the leadership, to the pastors and elders, and to every other member there, my personal life is your business. I am not an isolated Christian who floats by myself with no accountability. My private life, my personal life, is now your business. And I, as a Christian, never want to be in a place where I do not have that kind of spiritual authority and accountability as I follow Jesus Christ. I need it. And I want to be in a place where if I did screw up morally, or if I continued in a hardened, unrepentant way after sin, I would have men who would call me to account, who would come show up at my house, confront me, and say, John, you're a member of this church. You're also a member of the body of Christ by faith. 
we want to call you for events. We want to bring you back. Look, I want that. And I think you should want it too. Uh, go to church. Join a church. Number three, serve a church. Serve a church. Now, I want to attack this on two levels. First of all, the fact that you guys really do need the church. But secondly, that the church needs you. I'll actually start with the second one. Local churches, and I'm not just talking about this one, they need you. They need people of your age range with your abilities, with your excitement, with your talents, with your energy. We need you engaged in local churches in Wheaton and the surrounding areas during your college years. What you can bring with your excitement for the gospel, uh, with your connection with young people, with people of all ages in music ministry and disability ministry and outreach, we need you. We need your energy, your enthusiasm, your excitement about Christ. But you need the church too during your college years. Uh, a lot of you are living in dorms or apartments where you're with people the same age all the time. In fact, I met with one of you last year and, and you told me, I think it was your sophomore year, you told me, John, this is the second time that I've sat down and had a conversation with someone over coffee or a meal who's not my age in two years. The second time. You need to be connected to the intergenerational body of believers during your college years. You need to be talking to an 80-year-old and an 8-year-old on a Sunday morning. That's good for you. It was good for me during my college years. We need it. And that's part of the reason, and you'll hear more about this next week, we're going to do our small group vision and, and luncheon next week. Uh, free Portillo's lunch, by the way. There's a commercial for next week. Um, <laughs> But the way we do our small groups here at College Group is we have student leaders that are leading Bible study, but all of our small groups are hosted by families from our church. So it's a way that you're not only connecting with each other, but you're connecting with an older couple in their home, a lot of times with a home-cooked meal, someone from our church who's godly, who's raising kids, who can help you in the body of believers here in this church. Go to church, join a church, serve the church. Well, I'll leave you with this before, uh, before we sing a little bit more. Um, if you love Jesus Christ, and I think almost all of you do, I could hear it in your singing. If you love Jesus Christ, love his body. Love his body. The, the, the imperfect, scarred, sometimes messed up body of Jesus Christ for which he died. If you love Jesus, love his wife. <laughs> Don't trash his bride. Don't only criticize his bride. Love and cherish and spend time with his bride and try to make it better. And if you love Jesus Christ, don't be afraid to publicly identify yourself, commit yourself to his people. Wear the wedding ring. These are my people, for better or for worse. They're redeemed. We sat at the foot of the same cross where the Savior died for us. I'm with them in one local church which is part of a universal church. Now, one last point on this, and I want to be, I want you, especially you first-time visitors, to hear this really clearly. It does not have to be here. Now, you'll notice I have not, I, I don't think at least, I don't think I've tried to recruit you to the college ministry or to college church with this message. So if you go away from this and say, I could not listen to that John guy for the next four years of my life, <laughs> fine. Go find a local church where you like the pastor and where you think they're teaching the Bible, proclaiming the gospel faithfully, and give yourself to it. That's the takeaway. It's not about this church. It's about a local church that is faithfully proclaiming the gospel. It is this local manifestation of the wider people, community of God. That's the takeaway. Well, let me pray, and then we're going um, to sing, I think, a couple more songs to close. Heavenly Father, it is amazing, even as we think about just uh, so many congregations around the world that are, um, Lord, we're pockmarked, and we're, we're, we're hypocritical so many times, and we've got blind spots. I know we've got them here. And yet, Lord, your people, your people, your church, your body, you love them. You gave your son to die for sinners like us. And Lord God, I want to pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would convict many in this room to give themselves to your people, to a local church, in a real powerful, tangible way in the coming year. 
Lord, I think of so many congregations across Wheaton and the surrounding towns who would be so blessed by it. And I think of the young men and women sitting in this room who will be built up and strengthened in their faith because of the intergenerational gathering of people who declare the praises of Jesus. So Lord, we give ourselves to you and we also give ourselves to your people. And we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up.